to toy race tracks. That's hard to say. Two toy, two toy uh, race tracks form concentric circles. Let's start there. What are what are concentric circles? Nope. Circles that are concentric. Nice try. Uh, not connected. It's one circle inside of another circle where they share the same center. Okay. So if you didn't know that, good luck. All right. Um, says each racetrack is divided into 15 identical sections if the inside car travels 1.2 centimeters less than the outer car on each piece of track. Okay, so let's draw one of those 15 identical sections. Maybe that. So if this is S, this is S minus 1.2. Okay, there? Yes. All right. Uh, how much bigger is the radius of the outside track compared to the inside track? So we'll call this R1 and that R2. And I'm actually going to write this then as S1 and then S2. And I'm just going to write that S1 is... Uh, S2 minus 1.2. So far, so good? All right, so it seems clear that we're going to have to be using this arc length formula, right? Uh, so to do that, I need the central angle. What's that going to be? Nope. So how much is there in the circle? 360, and we're going to divide that up into 15 identical sections. Thank you. So 24 degrees. Or if we wanted to do it in radians, Either is okay. We could do it as um, 2 pi over 15. Doesn't matter which one you do. So far, so good? I'm going to use the radians one. The reason I'm going to do that is the system of the two equations I'm going to write is going to be this. And my big observation is that angle theta is the same angle in both sectors, right? So I can go ahead and plug some stuff in now. So I have S2 minus 1.2 equals 2 pi over 15 times R1. And then I have S2 equals 2 pi over 15 times R2. So I'm going to make a substitution now where since S2 is equal to 2 pi over 15 times R2, I'm going to drop that value into the S2 in equation 1. But I still seem to have a problem here, right? Because I still have two variables in one equation. Be real careful, though. It says, how much bigger is the radius of the outside track compared to the inside track? So the variable that I'm looking for 
is really R2 minus R1. So rather than solving for R2 and R1 separately, I'm just going to solve for the difference between the two of them. So if that's the case, I'm going to subtract the 2 pi over 15 times R1 from both sides. and add the 1.2 to both sides. I can then factor off the 2 pi over 15. And I'll multiply by the reciprocal. And that should be my final answer. So I get about 2.86 centimeters. Now, this is much harder than something I'd ask you to do on a test. So if you're, if you're trying to follow along and you got a little hazy on this one, that's, I wouldn't worry too much about it. This is harder than something that I would reasonably expect you to be able to do on your own, on a test or whatever. It's fine to struggle through it on the homework. Um, and again, if you couldn't even get the pick, if you didn't even get what concentric circles was, like not a whole lot of hope you're going to make any decent progress on this, right? You needed the picture in the beginning. Um, other homework questions? Which one? 14 or 18? Oh, just from the table thing? Sure. Okay. So if I'm doing 14, first thing I do is I observe that, hey, my angle's in radians. So I can just say S is equal to the radian measure times the radius. And then it's just calculator time. Am I cool to leave it there, Delaney? Yeah. Okay. Which the 18 was the other one you said? Yeah. Okay. Here I'm going to notice that, hey, this time, my angle is in degrees. So if I do that, um, and we're looking for R this time, right? So if I fill everything in, I have 5.89 equals 118 pi over 180 times r. So you get the r by itself. I'm just going to multiply by the reciprocal. And at that point, it's calculator time.
Last call on questions from homeworks, Ava? Four? Sure. So this is in degrees. To convert it to radians, then I need to multiply it by pi over 180. Now it's 37.41, or 0.41, and 180. There's no common divisor between those since it's a decimal. So I'm just going to do type it into my calculator and press enter and do some rounding. So there it is. Let's see, to the round to the hundredth. So 0 0.065. That's it. Does that feel okay? It's like, oh, that's it? Yeah, that's yeah, that it. You know, it's okay. Easy. It's always happy when it's easier than I expected it to be, right? It's like, oh, I just type in my calculator and press enter, huh? All right. Hi, Mary. Hi. Okay. Let's see, should we start the new stuff here then? All right, let's do it. So remember, the goal in chapter two, we're taking our definition of sine, cosine, and tangent that in geometry relied on the angle being an acute angle inside of a right triangle and we want to extend that definition so that we can use sine cosine and tangent on any number so an angle could be any number and we can still uh, we can still do that so what we're going to do is first things first we want to define what it means for an angle to be, say, bigger than 180 degrees, or bigger than 360 degrees, or even negative numbers. Because right now, in geometry, how, what's the biggest angle you can draw? 180 degrees, which is a straight line, right? So right now, our first order of business is going to be constructing a way to draw an angle that's bigger than 180, or smaller than zero. Everybody's on board? So to do this, what we're going to do is we're going to embed our angle measure inside of the xy axis. So xy. So we're going to think of one of our angles or one of the arms of our, the vertex of our angle is going to be fixed at the origin. And one arm of our angle is always going to lie on the positive x-axis. We call this the initial side. And then... The other arm of our angle is going to rotate uh, counterclockwise around the xy axis, and wherever it stops will indicate the angle. So, for example, if we wanted to do, say, a 270 degree angle.
We start at the initial side. And how far, how many degrees is a quadrant on my xy axis? So like from here to here is how many degrees? 90, right? So to there is 180 now, right? Two 90s. And to here would be 270. So that's how we'll draw a 270 degree angle. Look, we just drew an angle that's bigger than 180. Ooh. What if it's bigger than uh, 360? What would I do? Well, the same thing. We start on the initial side and we rotate. So there's 90, 180, 270, 360, and then 45 more. And that's my 405 degree angle. I just went around once and then 45 more. It's like, oh, I thought this was going to be complicated. This is really quite simple, right? Um, as a piece of vocab, this side that's doing the rotating, we call the terminal side of our angle. Yes, of course. Uh, but Mr. Kulik, you said we could do negatives also. Like what's a negative angle going to be? Yeah, we're going to just spin the opposite direction. Exactly. So instead of going counterclockwise for a positive angle, we're going to go clockwise for a negative angle. So if we do here is negative 90 and then negative 45 more, and there's going to be our negative 135 degree angle. Ooh, this is lovely, really simple. And now I can represent an angle of any size, right? If I want my angle to be 10,000 degrees, well, I can draw that. It's going to be a lot of spins, but we can do it, right? If I want my angle to be negative 800 degrees, well, it's going to be some spins, but we can do it. We've now found a way to define an angle to be any real number. Everybody's cool? Okay. Um, so when we do this, this is called a standard position angle. So that method of we're going to fix the vertex to the origin, we're going to lay one arm of our angle on the positive x-axis, and rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise respectively and draw our terminal side. That angle that we've just drawn is called a standard position angle. Everybody's cool? Let's uh, do a quick example here. So on your own sheet of paper, Actually, let's use some colors here, cool like. Take a minute on your own sheet of paper. Try to draw these three standard position angles. And we'll I'll draw the answers here in a second. But take a minute and try drawing these on your own. So where do we start at? Always at that same point. Yeah, so again, we start. Yeah, always at that, right? 
every single time, vertex fixed at the origin, one arm on the positive x-axis, and then you go from there. This skill that we're practicing right now is foundational to everything we're gonna be doing for really most of semester one. So if you have the troubles doing this, you wanna get those addressed sooner rather than later because it's really critically important that you can draw your picture and get your terminal side in the correct quadrant. Okay. Is it is it in the one note you think, or no? Oh no, I think it's actually in the one note. No, I'll take okay. a picture then. Sorry, no. Okay. Send me an email once you've done that, and I'll be gladly check it in. No problem. You guys still drawn or are you are we good? Still drawn? Are we finished? Okay. So three oh five ninety one eighty two seventy And then 35 more, puts me like there. Let me just draw it in like. So remember, like, we're just counting 90, 90, 90, 35. So what's this section over here have to be then? Fifty-five, right? How do we get that? Ninety minus thirty-five. Each quadrant has to be ninety degrees total, right? So far, so good. Okay. I'm going to erase all these numbers out of here. Now let's do 750. So again, initial side, and we do 90, 180, 270, 360. What are we doing here, computer? Uh, 450, uh, 540, 630, 720, And then like 30 more. Should you see the spiral when I'm looking at your paper? Yes. Yes, I should see the spiral on your paper. Negative 415. So I start, again, vertex fixed at the origin, my initial side. Since it's negative though, I'm rotating clockwise. So negative 90, negative 180, negative 270, negative 360, and then like 45 more puts me to there. Okay. <laughs> 
So far, so good. So what do we notice about a 45 degree angle and a 405 degree angle? Let's draw them. So there's my 45. Everybody's cool with that. And then my 405, see 90, 180, 270, 360, and then 45 more. What do we notice when we draw those? They're on top of each other. The terminal side of each angle lies in the same location. Yes, sir. Of course. We have a name for this. This is called a co, those are called coterminal angles. So, again, angles with different measurements but have the same coterminal side. For a given angle, how many coterminal angles does it have? So, what I mean is like, How many angles are coterminal to, say, 30 degrees? Can somebody give me an angle that's coterminal? <clears throat> coterminal to 30 degrees. Uh, so another angle that's coterminal to 30 degrees. Okay, good. Does somebody have another one? Is there another one? Uh, mm, good. That's correct. Anybody see another? Mm, excellent. Bladen's got it. What are you doing each time? Or adding 360 or subtracting 360. Excellent. So how many coterminal angles could we get to, to 30 degrees? As many as we want. Specifically, infinitely many, right? So how do we write this? How do we write 
that there's going to be, because not every angle is coterminal to, three thir or to three or 30 degrees. Well, not every angle is going to be coterminal to 30 degrees. We just want to describe a way that, how would we describe all of them? So we say 30 degrees plus 360K, where K has to be an integer, a positive or negative whole number. So if K is 2, I've added 360 twice. That'll give me a coterminal angle. If K is negative 5, I've subtracted 365 times. That'll give me a coterminal angle. As long as you're using a whole number, positive or negative, that's a way to generate a new coterminal angle. And that'll give me all of the coterminal angles. Ava. Yes. By adding or subtracting 360, an angle that's coterminal to it. So a situation like this. Nope. Where the terminal side is in the exact same spot. See the two angles here, the red and the green? Oh, so you want to make it like circle around one more time? That's exactly what adding 360 is going to do. It circles around one more time and stops at the same place it started. Cool. All right. Let's have you guys try one on your own here real quick. Sure. Yeah. How would you fall in bed? You should be out of school. I fell asleep last night and in charge. I think there's a USB down there that you just have to unplug something else to plug your thing in. Paul. Sure. So try this on your own. I'll write down the answers here real quick afterwards. Who's got an answer for part A? Excellent. How'd you get those, Bladen? Added positive, or added 360 to 47 to get 407, and subtracted 360 from 47 to get the negative 313. Are these the only two answers? No. no. Could have you given me 407 and then like 767? Mm -hmm. Sure. Could you give me negative 313 and negative 673? Mm -hmm. Sure. Could have you cooked up two other ones? Mm -hmm. Sure. Right? Everybody's cool? How are we going to do part B though? What do you notice about the angle in part B? Pi over 3. What kind of measure is it in then? It's in radians, right? How can I tell it's in radians even though I didn't write radian next to it? Well, did you see a degree symbol afterwards? No. If there's no degree symbol, it's radians. 
Yeah. Okay. So, okay. So pi over three, and I can add 360 to that, right? Ma, ma, ma. Cannot do that. Why can't I do that? Well, can I add like three feet to two centimeters and get an answer? Mm -hmm. you convert it. I have to convert it because they're different units right now. So let's, since our angle was given in radians, let's give our answer in radians. So let's convert 360 degrees into radians. Okay, what do I have to multiply 360 by to convert it into radians? Uh, other way around, pi over, 180. pi over 180. Remember that units need to be on opposite levels of the fraction. What's the common divisor between 180 and 360? Well, 180, right? 180 divided by 180 is 1. 360 divided by 180 is 2. So 2 pi. Okay. So I have pi over 3 plus 2 pi. What am I going to need to do to add those? Um, got to do something. How about I need a common denominator? What would the common denominator be between these two fractions? How about three? So I'm going to multiply. Yes. Sure. Yeah. So I'm going to multiply by three over three. When I multiply three times two pi, what do I get? Not five pi. Three times two pi is. 6 pi, oh gosh, there you go. It happens to the best of us. Okay? No. All right. So now I have pi over 3 plus 6 pi over 3. Well, I know it's going to be something over 3, right? What's 1 pi plus 6 pi? How many pies do I have? 7 pies. We didn't get up. I mean, if you want to. There's like bugs in this room or something. Got him. Oh, yeah. A tiny little fruit fly. This tiny squished fruit fly. What? Okay. You like the Drosophila malangaster? That's the Latin name for a fruit fly. You didn't do you? I did a we did a fruit fly experiment in biology class in high school. And you remember that in high school? Yeah. Why wouldn't you? I don't remember. I don't remember anything. Okay. So that's one of my coternal angles. What are we gonna do to get the next one? I'll just do it again. But instead of adding two pi here. I'm just going to cut to the chase because I know 2 pi is the same as 6 pi over 3. And just save myself some work, right? It's going to start with the common denominator. That looks really painful that your shoulders can bend that way. Okay. Now I don't want to embarrass anybody because... I'm not gonna. Re I'm not gonna tell you who it was. All Blade knows it was somebody behind him that he couldn't see. Shows like that. Some people have double jumping elbows. No. You're not cool. You're not. It wasn't me. Okay. What if we ask this question? I don't get it. I thought we were going to change it to like 360. We changed 360 to 2 pi. So 360, that would be 2 pi. Yes! 
Yes, that's the big takeaway. Yes, you beat me to it. So, if our angle is in degrees, and we want something coterminal to it, we're adding and subtracting 360. If our angle is in radians, and we want something coterminal to it, we're adding and subtracting 2 pi. So that we don't have to do that conversion again, we can just remember that it's 2 pi. What if I ask you if 37 and 7,057 are those coterminal? No idea. Check. How could we check? Uh, That's not going to do it. Now, if you just wanted to do it kind of the simple way on your calculator, you could just keep subtracting 360 until and see if you get 37 it seems like we don't right I don't like that that's pretty seems kind of silly to me instead I'm gonna use this idea here So if these two things are coterminal, if I say 7,057 should equal 37 plus 360k. And I'm going to just solve this equation for k now. If k is an integer, a positive or negative whole number, then yes, they're coterminal. If it's not, if it's a fraction or a decimal, Ooh, they are not coterminal. So let's do that. So we'll subtract 37. Oop. And then I'll divide by 360. Boop. And 720 divided by 360 is 19.5. So we conclude they're not coterminal because 19.5 is not an integer. What would the difference be if these were radian things? If the angles were in radians, what would the difference be? Set of 360, we would use 2 pi. Otherwise, it's the same idea. Just the operations are more tedious because they're in terms of pi and probably fractions rather than just whole number degrees. But like, that's inconvenient, but still totally doable. Okay, so far so good. Feel good about coterminal? No? We understand the idea though? Two angles that have two standard position angles where the terminal sides are in the same location? That's the big takeaway. Um, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna start building out, we have all the pieces now in place, start building out our new definition for sine, cosine, and tangent. All right. All 
All right, so let's say we have some standard position angle theta, like we've drawn here, and we pick some point on the terminal side of that angle. That point I've labeled P, and I've just given it the generic coordinates x, y. Everybody's okay here? Notice that to get to point P, we would have had to move x units over and then like y units up. Everybody's okay with that? And then the distance from the origin to our point P should be how far? How far should the distance between the origin and point P be? How far is that distance? Well, what kind of triangle have we drawn? A right, a right triangle, because we know the axes are perpendicular to each other. So in a right triangle, we can use the Pythagorean theorem. So I know that a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Or in this case, we could say the square root of x squared plus y squared is that side. Now that's a mouthful. I'm just going to abbreviate that as the letter R. So now, if I take this situation and I wanted to do, say, sine of theta, I can do opposite, which is y, over hypotenuse, which is r. Everybody's good here? So what have I done? We just did something impressive here. What just happened? Because it just looked like you did Soka Toa there. Right? But that's not what we've done. The result now is we've defined sine as a coordinate from some point on the terminal side of our angle and r, the distance from the origin to that point. So what we've done, we've just broken the shackles that tied us to a right triangle. We now have a definition for sine in terms of just a point on the terminal side of some angle. No longer are we locked into a right triangle. We can now do sine of 97 degrees. We can do sine of negative 200 degrees. We can do sine of 55,000 degrees because we can represent all of those angles with a standard position angle and presumably we can find some point on that standard position angle and plug them now into our formula. Is everybody okay with that notion? This is just a stepping stone onto the place where we're going to end up So what does this mean now in general for us? If we do this for each of our um, trig functions, we say the following. Well, I guess I should have used an alpha there because those are all in alphas. that sine is now y over r, cosine is now x over r, tangent is y over x, but I have this condition that x cannot equal zero there. Well, why is that in there?
because we can't divide by 0, guys. y over 0 is dividing by 0. What does that give you? Doesn't work, right? How do you split, you know, five things zero ways? You see, it doesn't make sense, right? Now you're sad because there's zero, you know, we don't have, we can't do the problem. So that's why that x cannot equal zero there. Why didn't we have to worry that before with Sokotoa? When we had opposite over adjacent, why didn't I have to worry about that? Because the adjacent side of a triangle can never be zero. It's a side of a triangle, right? What is x in this case? It's a coordinate. Those can be zero, right? There's no reason that my terminal side can't be lying you know, on the y-axis where the x-coordinate is zero. That could certainly happen. Is everybody okay? Why don't we have to worry about r being zero? Because it's a distance from the point on the terminal side to the origin. If it was zero, then the point on our terminal side would be the origin, and that doesn't make any kind of sense. So r cannot be zero by construction. Okay. That's why we didn't have anything listed for sine or cosine. But all the rest of them, we just have the condition that the denominator can't be zero when it's an x or a y. Since those are coordinates, those could be zero. All right, let's do an example. All right, the point negative 3, 4 lies on the terminal side of angle theta. Find the value of all six trigonometric ratios for angle theta. So we want sine theta, we want cosine theta, we want tangent theta, we want cosecant theta, secant theta, cotangent theta. Yes, of course. So we're going to start with sine is y over r. Well, y we know that's 4 because my point is x comma y. What's r again? If you look at the picture, it was... We got it from the Pythagorean theorem. So R in our case is type that in your calculator, tell me what you get. Take your calculator out, everybody. Try this for me. I'm asking you to do this for a reason. Yep, go ahead. Go grab it. Or grab one of these, you know, if you got one charge. In. Square root, negative 3 squared plus 4 squared. Type it in. You're welcome. Who got 2.64? Two six, two six Who got 5? How come you didn't get one of those two answers? Let's try it again. Who got 5? Let's answer this again. Good job. You're correctly able to type something in your calculator. Who got 2.64? Ooh, most common calculator mistake I see students make. Yeah, so if I type negative 3 squared into my calculator like this, my calculator is going to follow the order of operations. It will square it and then make it negative. Boo, that's not what we want. We need to make sure we're typing negative 3 squared into our calculator this way. 
and getting positive 9. I have to be very careful about this. This is something I see students make mistakes all the time when you're squaring negative numbers on your calculator. Please be careful about it. The answer here should be 5. So far, so good? Yeah. What's cosecant of theta then? Remembers last time. Should be able to do this quick in your head. Too much hesitation already. It's the reciprocal of sine. That's what I'm remembering. Five over four. Don't have to think about it. Just the reciprocal of sine. Let's do cosine now. That's x over r. x is negative 3. r is 5. Done. What's secant? OK. The reciprocal of cosine, so negative 5 thirds. Thanks, bro. Tangent is? y over x, and I'm just going to write it with the negative sign out front. Right, we all remember this from like arithmetic in elementary school, that like these are all the same thing, doesn't matter where you put the negative. Okay. What's cotangent going to be? Yep. Everybody happy? Okay. Now this is just like a stepping stone on the way to a, something a little bit better. So keep that in mind. We're going to do another example and then we're going to start moving um, to our final destination here with this. Okay, we're asked to do cosine of 150 without your calculator. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start by drawing 150 in standard as a standard position angle. So I've gone 90 degrees and then 30 more. I'm sorry, 60 more. So there's my 150. Everybody's okay so far? I'm going to pick a point P on my terminal side. And I'm going to make a right triangle as formed. What does the angle here in my right triangle have to be? What does that angle in my right triangle have to be, the one with the arrow? 30. Great. How'd you get 30? Uh, 180 minus 150. Great. We know there's 180 degrees on a straight line. 180 minus 150 is 30 degrees. That has to be 30 degrees. What does this one then have to be? Uh, 60. Oh, what kind of triangle do we have? 30, 60, 90. Special right triangle. Remember last time when I told you that those are those ratios are something you'd want to memorize. Yeah. Here's why it's coming back. Yeah, so the x side is going to be a square root three. I'm going to use a's instead of x's because we have x and y coordinate. I don't want to get confused. So I'm going to use a different letter rather than x here. This side is a, and this side would be two a. So my point p. The x and y here is going to be like a square root 3 at comma a. Oops, negative a square root 3. Why is it negative? 
Why did I make that x coordinate negative? What quadrant is point P is placed in? Yeah, the quadrant should have a negative x in it, right? Because it's in the second quadrant. So in the first quadrant, x and y's are both positive. In the second quadrant, the x's are negative, but the y's are positive. In the third quadrant, both coordinates are negative. And in the fourth quadrant, um, oops, that's not right. The x's are positive, but the y's are negative. So that's why I made the x coordinate negative. Everybody's okay with that? Very common mistake that students will make is not thinking about the quadrant that your point lies in and forgetting to make things negative that need to be negative. Okay. So cosine is going to be, oh, so we have this. We also get r out of this for free, right? R is just 2a. Woo! That's beautiful. So cosine 150 is going to be x over r, which reduces down to negative square root 3 over 2. Everybody okay with this, what we did there? Okay, so we're almost done here. Our final phase. If you notice in this problem, our R is 2A. In this problem, our R was 5. Our final step to kind of standardizing this process, our new definition for sine, cosine, and tangent, is to set r to be the same distance every time. So our final phase is going to be the same idea, except we pick p instead of being arbitrary so that r is 1. So we're just going to pick that point P on the terminal side so that R is always 1. What happens to these definitions here if R is 1? Sine alpha becomes just Y. cosine alpha becomes just x. Tangent doesn't change. Cosecant alpha becomes 1 over y. Secant alpha becomes 1 over x. Well, that why does that say tangent? That should say cotangent there, huh? Cotangent becomes or doesn't change. Let me go back and change that one. Yeeps, that's a big mistake. How did that last that long on this? Okay, cotangent. So far, so good? Okay. Now, what we want to do is we're going to Take all of our angles between 0 and 360 that are multiples of either 30 degrees, 45 degrees, or 60 degrees, and we are going to calculate the x and y coordinate when we fixed r to be 1 for each of those situations, okay? Pull up 
pull up the thing that I want to drop in here real quick. Hopefully that's not where I wanted it. Maybe is it over here? Not there either. Oh, Boise. Okay. Maybe I'll check here. There we go. That'll do. So we're going to fill this in. Okay. So zero, 30 degrees, 45 degrees, 60 degrees, 90, and then 120, 135, 150, 180, 210, 225, 240, 270. Um, 300, 315, 330, and then we'd be to 360 again, or zero. Everybody's okay? Now, some of these x-coordinates are really easy, right? So like here, the x-coordinate is one because I know the r is one, and the y-coordinate is zero because we're on the x-axis. Similarly here at 90 degrees, we have zero, one. At 180, it's negative one, zero. At 270, it's negative, or zero, negative one. So far, so good. Okay. Now, if we think back to our 45, 45, 90 triangle, Um, we know that we have x, x, and then x square root 2, correct? Well, I should probably, I'll call those a's. So far, so good. This is my r. I need this to be 1. So a has to equal 1 over the square root of 2. So 1 over the square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 1. So this is 1 over square root 2. This is 1 over square root 2. So here, the x and y's are going to just be 1 over square root 2, 1 over square root 2. Here, 135 is a multiple of 45. So those will be both 1 over square root of 2. But because we're in the second quadrant, the x coordinate needs to be negative. For 225, that's a multiple of 45, so that'll be 1 over the square root of 2, 1 over the square root of 2. But because we're in the third quadrant, both x and y coordinates are negative. 315, also multiple of 45, but since we're in the fourth quadrant, the y coordinate is negative. Everybody's okay? And I continue doing this for um, my... 30 degree angles and my 60 degree angles and I end up with this guy which is called the unit circle. Why do we call it the unit circle? Because the radius on this circle is 1. Yes, Ava? will what be on the test? The unit circle? Yes. It is the tool that we use from here on out to find exact values of trigonometric functions. We will use this on every test for the entire semester. 
<laughs> they don't they have like the tells you like what the, the what the course is about. All right. Here we go. Let's do an example here using this thing now. We've built this whole thing out. And yeah, I skirted through some details because it's more about using it. Oh yeah. All right. All right. Using the unit circle, fine, sine of 120. So I go to my unit circle. I locate 120 degrees. Yeah. Sine is equal to y. The y coordinate is square root 3 over 2. I am done. Did we see that? Yeah. That was so easy. Now, tangent of 5 pi over 4. I go to my unit circle. I locate 5 pi over 4. There it is. Tangent is y over x. What's negative 2 root 2 over negative 2 root 2? I'm sorry, negative square root of 2 over 2 divided by negative square root of 2 over 2. Guys, what's a divided by a? a? Let me, okay. What's a divided by a? a? One! Thank you from the back row. A is one. So what is negative root 2 over 2 divided by negative root 2 over one. 2? One! It's the same thing. If you divide a number by itself, it's just one. That's crazy. I know, it's hard. We're in like cosecant 390. Okay, so I'll go find 390 on my unit circle. Oh, no. It's uh, 30 degrees. Yes, great, because I find I just go and I locate an angle coterminal to this. So I just subtract 360. So I'll use just 30 degrees then. Cosecant is... 1 over y, so I have 1 over 1 half, that's the same as 2, just the reciprocal of 1 half. Whoa, math. All right, here's the rough part, guys, are you ready? We can now do up to 70. No, not this Sunday. Because we haven't, we won't have a class in between. Shh. Listen, listen, everybody needs to hear this. This assignment, 43 to 60, is not due this Sunday. It's due next Sunday because we would not have had a class to ask questions about before making it due. I will always give you a class in between when something is due because I want you to try it to come back and ask questions and then be able to finish it. Uh, the Delta math was assigned earlier. If you didn't finish that Delta math from Friday last week, you would still need to do it by Sunday, but nothing else. You're welcome. You're welcome. I almost forgot my calculator.